Hey again! Today we'll continue reading The Westing Game by Ellen Raskin, starting with chapter 19. Um, quick recap from last time. Um, a third bomb went off at Angela's bridal shower as she was opening gifts, um, and she was hurt and is now in the hospital, but is mostly okay. I think she, she had a scratch on her face, but um, for the most part she didn't have any major injuries. Um, and Grace and Mr. Who are convinced that lawyer or uh, that the lawyer, Ed Plum, is the murderer um, because of something that they did with their clues. And Theo is convinced that Otis Amber is the bomber because of something that he figured out with his clues. Um, Sidel is thinks that Angela is the bomber because of something she said she heard Turtle said say to Angela when she came to visit Angela in the hospital. And Dr. Deer thinks that he has found um, a doctor who can help Chris with his condition. Um, and they are all supposed to return to the, the Westing estate on Saturday night for, I guess, another gathering of the will reading or more clues being revealed or something like that, the next stage of the game. So let's continue to chapter 19. Chapter 19, Odd Relatives. Thursday was a sunny day, a glorious day. The autumn air was crisp and clear. None of the airs noticed. WPP crossed the tape at $44, $44.5, $46. $46 a share. Oh my. Don't sell until I would give the word, Baba, Alice Turtle had said. Baba. The dressmaker smiled at her new name and eased back in the chair, but not for long. WPP 48 and a fourth. Oh my, oh my. Fl Flora Bombach bit her thumbnail to the quick. If only the child was here. The child was being examined by the school nurse, having been caught again with her radio plugged in her ear. Turtle blamed her misbehavior on a toothache. The only thing that soothes the horrendous pain is listening to music. You should see a dentist, the nurse said. I have an appointment the ne next week, Turtle lied. Can I go home now? The pain is truly unbearable. No. The nurse packed the tooth with foul-tasting cotton and sent her back to class. So every half hour, Fat Tur Turtle had to ask permission to go to the lavatory in order to keep up with the latest stock market reports. Bladder infection, she explained. Crow polished Mrs. Wexler's sil silver teapot with a Westing disposable diaper for the third time. Two more days, the day after next. It was too painful going to that house, but Otis said she must, to collect her due. It was her penance to go back, not her due. Blessed is he who expects nothing. Boom! Just a warning to keep doors locked, the delivery boy said, dumping a carton of Westing paper products on the kitchen floor. You know, Crow, old pal, I think I figured out who the bomber is. Crow stiffened as she stared at her distorted reflection in the shining silver. Who? That's right, Otis Amber said. James Shin Hu. He wanted to put the coffee shop out of business, right? Then he had a home, bomb his own restaurant so no one would suspect him, right? And he catered the Wexler party. Nobody would notice if the caterer bought, brought in an extra box along with the food, right? James Shin Hu was the bomber. Crow's hands trembled, her face blotched with hate. That beautiful, innocent angel reborn. Sandy said her face will be scarred for life. James Shin Hu, beware, vengeance shall be mine. The judge rearranged her docket in order to have these last days free. Leave it to Sam Westing to interfere with her work. Sandy turned to his next entry. It's an interesting one. Crow. Birth, Bertha Erica Crow. Age 57. Mother died at childbirth. Raised by father. Deceased. Education. One year of high school. Married at 16. Divorced at 40. Ex-husband's name, Wendy Windkloppel. Hospital records, problems related to chronic alcoholism. Police record, three arrests for vagrancy. Gave up drinking when she took up religion. Started the Good Salvation Soup Kitchen on Skid Row. Works as a cleaning woman in Sunset Towers. Lives in maid's apartment on the fourth floor. Westing connection? Question mark. Yes, it is interesting, Judge Floyd replied, but it hardly tells us what we want to know. You've got a customer, Jake Wexler pointed a spare rib at the black-clad figure standing at the restaurant door. Must be a bill collector, who said, frowning over his account book. Grace looked up, saw it was only the cleaning woman, and returned to the sports photograph she was sorting. A dozen or so 
A dozen or more superstars would be framed and hung on one wall of who's on first. Come on over and join us, Jake shouted. Limping to their table, Crow heard Mrs. Wexler click her tongue. Sinful woman, she'll go to hell with her pride and her covetousness, covetousness and take that foot but butcher of a husband with her. And that one, the fat one, the glutton, the bomber, the mutilator of innocent children. Maybe she is a customer, who thought, recognizing the face clenched in righteous anger as that of a diner not, not being served fast enough. He rose and pulled the chair out for Crow. My wife will be serving a Chinese tea lunch shortly. Madam Hu placed a ver variety of dumplings on the table, giggled at Jake, and ran back to the kitchen. That tittering Madam Hu was a beautiful woman, and quite young. Grace, casting a suspicious eye on her husband, was suddenly seized by a surge of gnawing jealousy. Maybe it was just the fried dumpling. Madam Hu returned to pour the tea. Jake patted her hand. Good, Grace noticed. She's clutching her stomach, about the time she, about time she felt jealous. The podiatrist turned his smile to crow. Nothing wrong with your appetite, I'm happy to see. Nothing is wrong with my mouth, the cleaning woman replied, looking down at her plate. It's my feet that hurt. That corn you cut out didn't heal yet. I got a callus on the sole of my left foot, and my ingrown toenail is growing in again. Grace clasped a hand over her mouth and ran out of the restaurant. Mr. Hu headed for the kitchen. Your trouble comes from years of wearing the wrong kinds of shoes, Jace lectured. Jake lectured. Crow wasn't listening. James Shin Hu, the bomber, was coming back. He had something in his hand. Here, Crow, try these. I invented them myself. Paper inner soles. They'll make you feel like you're floating on air. It's tough standing on your feet all day. Here, take them. Crow examined the two pads of spongy folded paper. How much? Nothing. Compliments of the house. Still suspicious, Crow slipped the inner soles into her shoes and tried walking. What a blessed relief. Otis Ambrose was wrong. James Shin Hu was a charitable man. He couldn't be the bomber. Crow floated out of the restaurant without paying for her lunch. Oh no, not another victim, Sadell Pulaski cried, stuffing her notes under the mattress. The nurse wheeled Chris next to Angela's bed and explained that the boy was being tested for a new medication. Are you all right? she asked, bending over the squirming patient. Chris was trying to remove a blank, sealed envelope from his bathroom pocket. He knew his brother had a crush on Angela. He figured Theo must have sneaked upstairs in the wrong bathrobe to slip this letter under Angela's door, then remembered she was in the hospital and was too shy to give it to her in person. Look at that smile, Sidel claimed. For, from Theo, he said. Chris hoped wa to watch Angela read the love letter, but the nurse insisted he return to his room. Bye-bye, good luck, Sidel called. Angela waved a bandage hand. M -m mountain tin Chris replied. From t turtle Serves her right from kicking his partner. Mountain, Angela thought. Turtle's MT stood for mountain, not empty. And the letter was not from Theo. Your love has two. Here are two for you. Take her away from the sin and hate now, before it is too late. Again, two clues were taped at the bottom. With majesties. Crow and, Amber Otis, Crow and Otis Amber's clues are not king and queen, she told Sidel. They are both. They are with thy beautiful majesties. Sandy and the judge were still at work with the hair, on the heirs. Wexler, Jake Wexler, age 45, podiatrist, graduated from Marquette, married 22 years, has two daughters, see below. Grace Windsor Wexler, born Gracie Wins Winklopel, age 42, Married to above, claims to be an interior decorator. Spends most of her time in the Chinese restaurant or the beauty parlor. She and Jake, see above, have two daughters, see below. Angela Wexler, age 20. Engaged to marry D. Denton Deer, also an heir. One year college, high grades. Victim of third bombing, embroiders a lot. Turtle Wexler, real name, Tabitha Ruth Wexler. Age 13. Junior high school student. Plays the stock market. Smart kid, but kicks people. Flora Bombach calls her Alice. Westing connection. Grace Windsor Wexler claims that Sam Westing is her real uncle. Angela looks like Violet Westing. So does Grace in a way, except she's older. Sandy fidgeted with his pen. There's something I didn't write down. Maybe I shouldn't tell you, being you being a judge and all, but, well, Jake's, Jake Wexler... 
He's a bookie. No, he should not have told her. A small-time operator, I'm sure, Mr. McSuthers, the judge replied coldly. It can have no bearing on the matter before us. Sam Westing manipulated people, cheated workers, bribed officials, stole ideas, but Sam Westing never smoked or drank or placed a bet. Give me a bookie any day over such a fine, upstanding, clean-living man. The doorman's face reddened. He pulled the dented flask from his hip pocket and downed several swigs. She had been too harsh. Would you like me to fix you a drink, Mr. McSuthers? No, thanks, Judge. I would prefer my good old scotch. Windclawful. The judge's outburst was so unexpected, Sandy had a hard time keeping down the last swig. Grace Wexler's maiden name is not Windsor. It's Windclawful, the judge explained, exclaimed, rifling through the, page the pages of Sandy's notebook. Here it is, Bertha Erica Crow, ex-husband's name, Windy Windclawful. Sandy stopped coughing, started laughing. Grace Windsor Wexler is related to somebody, all right. She's related to the cleaning woman. Think she knows, Judge? I doubt it. Besides, we cannot be certain of the relationship. I'd like to see the documents in Crow's folder again. I'm sure it's Windclawful, Judge. I checked all my spellings three times over. Judge Ford reread the private investigator's reports. Mr. McSuthers, it is Windclawful, but look very carefully at the name of the woman in this interview. Bertha Erica Crow? Sure, I knew her. She and her pa lived in the upstairs flat. We were best friends, almost like sisters, but she was the pretty one with her beautiful complexion and long gold red hair. She left school to marry a guy named Win Winclawful. Haven't seen or heard from her since. She's not in any trouble, is she? Transcript of a taped interview with Sybil Pulowski, November 12th. Pulowski, the doorman said. Not just Pulowski, the judge pointed out. Sybil Pulowski. Sam Westing wanted Crow's childhood friend, Sybil Pulowski, to be one of his heirs. He got Sidel Pulowski instead. Gee, judge, I never noticed that. Boy, am I dumb. What does it mean? It means, Mr. McSuthers, is, what it means, Mr. McSuthers, is that Sam Westing made his first mistake. Chapter 20. Confessions. Friday came quickly to the Westing heirs. Too quickly. Time was running out. Turtle skipped school. She was in trouble enough, but she could build her own school and hire her own kind of teachers when she became a millionaire. In spite of having Turtle at her side, Flora Bombach still stared at the ever-changing, endless tape from the edge of the chair, chewed what remained of her fingernails, and uttered an oh my each time WPP went by. At 2 o'clock, Westing Paper Products sold at $52 a share, its highest price in 15 years. Now, Baba, sell! Doug Hu had a, le a legitimate excuse from classes. Tomorrow was the big track meet. He jogged, he sprinted, he ran at full speed, not on the track, but on the trail of Otis Amber. Back and forth from the shopping center to Sunset Towers, again and again and again, and, hey, this is a new direction. Otis Amber parked his delivery bike in front of a rooming house and went inside. Doug waited, hidden in a doorway across the street, and waited. People came and went, but no Otis Amber. Doug, jog Doug jogged up and down the block for two hours. Still no sign of Otis Amber. Doug was cold and hungry, but at least his feet didn't hurt anymore. Last night when he asked Doc Wexler about the blisters, the podiatrist told him to see his father. His father, of all people. But those paper inner soles really worked. At five o'clock, Otis Amber skipped out of the rooming house, hopped on his bicycle, and returned to Sunset Towers empty-handed. Doug's assignment was over. Well, almost over. Where was Theo? Theo was being patched up in the hospital emergency room after a slight miscalculation in his solution experiment. Fortunately, no one else was around and the lab blew up. You like playing with explosives, kid? The bomb squad detective asked. Accidents in high school chemistry were not unusual, but this student lived in Sunset Towers. As experimenting on chemical fertilizers, Theo replied, wincing as the doctor probed his shoulder for a glass shard. The first bomb went off in your folks' coffee shop, right? Your mother and father work you pretty hard, don't they? They work harder than I do. Why all the fireworks? I mean, sorry, why, are the, why all the questions? Your captain said that the Sunset Towers explosions were just fireworks. Sure they were, but bombers have a funny habit of going in for bigger and better bangs, until they get caught. Theo had an alibi. He was nowhere near that Wexler apartment that day the third bomb went off. 
The detective grunted a warning about careless chemistry, but Theo had already learned his lesson. Ouch. At last, the coffee shop owner de himself delivered up the up order. The judge came right to the point. Mr. Theodorakis, tell me about your relationship with Violet Westing. I have reason to believe a life is in danger, or I would not ask. It was a question he had expected. I grew up in Westington, where my father was a factory foreman. Violet Westing and I were what you'd call childhood sweethearts. We planned to get married someday, when I could afford it, but her mother broke us up. She wanted Violet to marry somebody important. The judge had to interrupt. Her mother? Are you saying it was Mrs. Westing who arranged the marriage, not Sam Westing? George Theodorakis nodded. That's right. Sam Westing tried to involve Violet in his business. I guess he hoped she'd take over the paper company one day, but she had her heart set on being a teacher. Besides, Violet didn't have much of a business sense. After that, her father never paid her much attention. Go on. The judge held the witness in her stare. The subject was becoming painful, and Mr. Theodorakis faltered several times in the telling. Mrs. Westing handpicked that politician, probably figured the guy would end up in the White House and her daughter would be First Lady. But Violet thought he was nothing but a cheap political hack, a cheap crook. Violet was a gentle person, an only child. She couldn't turn against her mother. She couldn't face marrying that guy. I guess she couldn't find any way out except... Mrs. Westing sort of went out off her rocker after Violet's death, and I, well, it was a long time ago. Thank you, Mr. Theodorakis, the judge said, ending the interrogation. The man had a different life now, different loves, different problems. Thank you. You have been a big help. Sandy was now able to complete the entry. Theodorakis. Theo Theodorakis, age 17, high school senior, works in family coffee shop, wants to be a writer, seems lonely, can't find anyone to pay, play chess with. Christos Theodorakis. Age 15, younger brother of above, confined to wheelchair, disease struck about four years ago, knows a lot about birds. Westing connection, father was childhood sweetheart of Sam Westing's daughter, who looked like Angela Wexler. Mrs. Westing broke up the affair. She wanted her daughter to marry somebody else, but Violet Westing killed herself before the wedding. Neither parents of above are heirs. I hear the new medicine they're trying out with on Chris is doing some good, Sandy reported, but the poor kid's court but the poor kid needs more help than medicine. He's real smart, you know. Chris could have a real future, be a scientist or a professor even, but it will take a pile of money, more money than his folks could ever could ever make to put him through college with a handicap like that. The parents interest me more, the judge said. Why are they not heirs? Sandy had some thought on that too. Maybe Sam Westing didn't want to embarrass George Theodorakis, him being married and all. Or maybe Westing figured he'd be too busy with his coffee shop to stay in the game. Or maybe Westing blamed him for his daughter's death, figuring they should have eloped. No, if Sam Westing blamed Mr. Theodorakis, he would have made him an heir in this miserable game, the judge replied. There are too many maybes here, which is what Sam Westing planned. We must not allow ourselves to be distracted from the real issue. Which heir did Sam Westing want punished? The person who would hurt him most, Sandy guessed. And who would that be? The person who caused his daughter's death? Exactly, Mr. McSuthers. Sam Westing plotted against the person he held responsible for his daughter's suicide, the person who forced Violet Westing to marry a man she loathed. Mrs. Westing? But that's not possible, Judge. Mrs. Westing is not one of the heirs. I think she is, Mr. McSuthers. The former wife of Sam Westing must be one of the heirs. Mrs. Westing is the answer, and whoever she is, she is the one we have to protect. Chapter 21 the fourth bomb. The door to the to apartment 2C opened. Flora Bombox screamed, and Turtle flung herself on the pile of money they had been counting. It was Theo, not the thief. Can I borrow your, your bike for a few hours? It's very important. Theo was not a runner like Doug, who was, for, who was fuming about his being so late. He needed the bicycle to follow Otis Amber right now. Turtle stared at him in stony silence. I didn't make that sign in the elevator. Besides, you already kicked me for it. Please, Turtle. She still wouldn't answer, punk kid. I had a long talk with the police today, but I, refer but I refused to tell them who the bomber was. What's that supposed to mean? What does she think it means? It means that he and everybody else knows that Turtle is the bomber. 
Never mind. Can I have your bike or not? Why do you want it? Theo ground his teeth. Take it easy. Andr anger won't help any more than the blackmail did. Try being a good guy. I saw Angela in the hospital today. She sends her regards. What's that supposed to mean? You let me have that bike, Turtle Wexler, or, or else. Turtle did not have to ask what or else meant. Police, bomber, Angela. But how did Theo find out? Here, she threw the padlock key across the room and waited for him to rush out before she let go of the money. He's such a nice boy, Flora Bombach remarked. Sure, Turtle replied, dialing the phone number of the hospital. Angela Wexler, room 325. Room 325 is not accepting any calls. Turtle hung up the phone. If Theo knew, others knew. Angela had set off those fireworks, wanting to get caught, but it was different now. Now she was confused. Now she was just plain scared. They could force a confession out of her in no time. The guilt was right there, staring out of those big blue eyes. Maybe they're questioning her now. Baba, I'm not feeling so good. I think I'll go home to bed. Weaving through rush hour, on turtle, uh, rush hour traffic on Turtle's bike, Theo trailed the bus to a, steamy, to a steamy downtown district across the railroad tracks where Crow and Otis got off. Skid Row. The pair wandered through the dimly lit, littered, and stinking street, bending over grimy bums asleep in doorways, raising them to their unsteady feet, and leading the ragtag procession into a decaying storefront. Paint was peeling off the letters on the window. Good Salvation Soup Kitchen. A drunk wreck of a man lurched into Theo and put a quarter into the filthy outstretched hand, more out of fright than charity. Snatches of him singing drifted toward him as the last of the stragglers staggled, staggered through the door. Theo crossed the narrow street and pressed his nose against the steamy soup kitchen window. Rows of wretched souls sat hunched on wooden benches. Crow stood before them in her neat black dress, her hands raised towards the crumbling ceiling. Behind her, Otis Amber stirred a pot, stirred a boiling mess in a big iron pot. Theo pedaled back to Sunset Towers at a furious pace. Whatever brought Crow and Otis Amber to these lower depths was none of his business. He hated himself for spying. He hated Sam Westing and his dirty money and his dirty game. Theo felt as dirty as the derelicts he spied on. Dirtier. The judge thought they had finished with the heirs. Not quite, the doorman said. McSuthers, Alexander McSuthers, called Sandy, age 65, born Edinburgh, Scotland, immigrated to Wisconsin, age 3, education, 8th grade, jobs, mill worker, union organizer, prize fighter, doorman, married, 6 children, grew 2 grandchildren, Westing Connection, worked in paper, Westing Paper Plant 20 years, Fired by Sam Westing himself for trying to organize the workers. No pension. Sandy turned to a blank page, pushed his taped glasses up to the broken, broken bridge of his nose, and looked at the judge. Name? It had not seemed sporting to investigate one's own partner, but Mr. But Miss Sellers was right. This was a Westing game. Of course, she had kept some facts from him about the other heirs, but only because she did not trust his blabbering. Josie Joe Ford, with a hyphen between Josie and Joe. Age, 42. Education, Columbia. Law degree, Harvard. The judge waited for the doorman to enter the information in his slow, cramped lettering. He had to be meticulous in order to prove he was better than his 8th grade education. It's a pity he had not gone further. He was quite a clever man. Jobs? Assistant, direct, assistant District Attorney. Judge, Family Court, State Supreme Court, Appellate Division. Appellate has two P's and two L's. Never married, no children. Westing connection? The judge paused, then spoke so rapidly Sandy had to stop taking notes. My mother was a servant in the Westing household. My father worked for the railroad and was the gardener on his days off. You mean you lived in the Westing house? Sandy asked with obvious surprise. You knew the Westings? I barely saw Mrs. Westing. Violet was a few years younger than I, doll-like and delicate. She was not allowed to play with other children especially the skinny, long-legged, black daughter of the servants. Gee, you must have been lonely, Judge, having nobody to play with. I played with Sam Westing. Chess. Af hour after hour, I sat staring down at that chessboard. He lectured me, he insulted me, and he won every game. The judge thought of their last game. She had been so excited about taking his queen, only to have the master checkmate her in the next move. 
Sam Westing had deliberately sacrificed his queen, and she had fallen for it. Stupid child, you can't have a brain in that frizzy head to make a move like that. Those were the last words he ever said to her. The judge continued, I was sent to boarding school when I was 12. My parents visited me at school when they could, but I, was, I never set foot in the Westing house again, not until two weeks ago. Your folks must have worked really hard, Sandy said. An education like that costs a fortune. Sam Westing paid for my education. He saw that I was accepted into the best schools, probably arranged for my first job, perhaps more. I don't know. That's the first decent thing I've heard about the old man. Hardly decent, Mr. McSuthers. It was to Sam's West Sam Westing's advantage to have a judge in his debt. Needless to say, I have excused myself from every case remotely connected with Westing affairs. You're awfully hard on yourself, Judge. And on him. Maybe Westing paid for your education because you were smart and needy and you did all the rest yourself. This is getting us nowhere, Mr. McSuthers. Just right. Westing Connection. Education financed by Sam Westing. Debt never repaid. Theo, upset over his skid row snooping, took out his anger on the up button, poking it, jabbing it, until the elevator finally made its way down to the lobby. Slowly, the door slid open. He stared down at the sparkling, sputtering arsenal, yelled and belly flopped to the carpet as rockets whizzed out of the elevator inches above his head. Boom, boom! A blinding flash of white fire streaked through the lobby, through the open entrance door, and burst into a chrys chrysanthemum of color in the bright, bright sky. Then the elevator door closed. The bomber had made one mistake. The last rocket blasted off when the elevator returned to the third floor. Boom! By the time the bomb squad reached the scene, by way of the stairs, the smoke had cleared, but the young girl was still huddled on the hallway floor, tears streaming down her turtle-like face. For heaven's sakes, say something, her mother said. Tell me where it hurts. The pain was too great to be put into words. Five inches of turtle's braid were badly singed. Grace Wexler attacked the policeman. Nothing but a childish prank, you said. Some childish prank. Both my children cruelly injured, almost killed. Maybe now you'll do something, now that it's too late. Unshaken by the mother's anger, the policeman held up the sign that had been taped to the elevator wall. The bomber strikes again. On the reverse side was a handwritten composition. How I Spent My, my Summer Vacation by Turtle Wexler. Grace grabbed the theme and shook it at her daughter, who was being rocked in Flora Bombach's arms. Somebody stole this from you, didn't they, Turtle? You couldn't have done such an awful thing. Not to Angela, not to your own sister. Could you, Turtle? Could you? I want to see a lawyer, Turtle replied. The bomb squad, faced with six hours overtime filling out forms and delivering the delinquent to a juvenile detention facility, decided it was best for all concerned to escort the prisoner to apartment 4D and place her in, in the custody of Judge Ford. Judge Ford put on her black robe and seated herself behind the desk. Before her stood a downcast child looking very sad and very sorry. Not at all like the turtle she knew. You surprised me, Turtle Wexler. I thought you were too smart to con commit such a dangerous, destructive, and super stupid act. Yes, ma'am. Why did you do it, Turtle? To hurt someone? To get even with someone? No, ma'am. Of course not. Turtle kicked shins. She was not the type to bottle up her anger. You do understand that a child would not receive as harsh a penalty as an adult would? That there would be no permanent cr criminal record? Yes, ma'am. I mean, no, ma'am. She was protecting someone. She had set off the fireworks in the elevator to divert suspicion from the real bomber. But who was the real bomber? Nothing to do but drag it out of her, name by name, starting with the least likely. Are you protecting Angela? No. The judge was astounded by the excited response. Angela could not be the bomber. Not that sweet, pretty thing. Thing? Is that how she regarded that young woman? As a thing? And what had she ever said to her except, I hear you're getting married, Angela, or how pretty you look, Angela? Had anyone asked her about her ideas, her hopes, her plans? If I had been treated like that, I would have used dynamite, not fireworks. No, I would have just walked out and kept right on going. But Angela was different. What a senseless thing to do, the judge said aloud. Yes, ma'am. Turtle stared down at the carpet, wondering if she had given Angela away. Judge Ford rose and placed an arm around Turtle's bony shoulders. She had never wished for a sister until this moment. Turtle, will you give me your word that you will never play with fireworks again? Yes, ma'am. 
While we're at it, do you have anything else to confess? Yes, ma'am. I was in the Westing house that night that Mr. Westing died. Good Lord, child, sit down and tell me. Turtle began with the purple wave story, went on to the whisperings, the bedded down corpse, the dropped peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and her mother's cross, and ended with the $24 she had won. Did either you or Doug Who call the police? No, ma'am, we were too scared. We just ran. Is that a crime? The judge said it was a criminal offense to conceal a murder. But Mr. Westling, Mr. Westing didn't look murdered, Turtle argued. Argued, he looked asleep, like he did in the coffin. He looked like a wax dummy. A wax dummy? Now Turtle was the one surprised by the excited response. The judge thinks it might have been a real wax dummy, not a corpse at all. Then what happened to Sam Westing? The judge regained her composure. Not reporting a dead body is a violation of the health code, but I wouldn't worry about it. Is there anything else, Turtle? Yes, ma'am, Turtle replied, glancing at the portable bar. Could I have a little bourbon? What? Just a little, on a piece of cotton to put in my cavity. My tooth hurts something awful. Relieved at not having a juvenile alcoholic on her hands, Judge Ford prepared the home remedy. Is that better? Good. You may go home now. Home meant going to Baba. Baba loved her no, no matter what, and Turtle didn't care if the others thought she was the bomber, except Sandy. He was walking toward her right now, bouncing, walking his bouncy walk, but not smiling. Sandy disappointed in her. He thinks he heard her own. She, he thinks she heard his, her own sister. He doesn't want to be friends anymore. How's my girl? Sandy said, cupping his hand under her chin and lifting her head. Woo! Hitting the bottle again? It's just bourbon on cotton for my toothache. Yeah, I've heard that one before. Honest, Sandy. Turtle was pointing inside her wide open mouth. The door. The doorman peered in. Wow, that's some cavity. It looks like the Grand Canyon. Tomorrow morning, you're going to see my dentist. No talk, no back talk. He's very gentle. You won't feel a thing. Promise you'll go? Turtle nodded. Sandy smiled. Good, then down to business. My wife's having a birthday tomorrow. I thought one of your gorgeous striped candles would make a swell present. There's only one candle left, Turtle replied. It's the best of the lot. Six super colors. I spent a lot of time making it. That's why I wouldn't part with it. But since it's for your wife's birthday, Sandy, I'll let you have it for only five dollars and I won't charge you sales tax. Try not to stick your fanny out so far, Angela said from her chair. Now that Sidel Pulowski depended on crutches, she lurched clumsily, hobbled by old habits. Just keep reading those clues, the secretary straightened, shoulders back, stomach in, until her next step. With their telephone switched off and contagious disease added to the no visitors, to the no visitors sign, the bomb victims have privacy at last. Sidel had twice read the entire will aloud. Now Angela, her hands unbandaged, was reshuffling the, t the collected clues. Brains, spacious, grace, good, hood, with beautiful majesties, from thy purple waves, on no mountain. Again, Sidel ordered, change them around and read either the word on or the word no. Both together are confusing. Good, spacious, grains, with, grace, on, thy, purple, mountain, hood, waves, from, majesties, beautiful. Shh, someone is at the door. Angela picked up the note that was slipped underneath. My darling Angela, I guess the sign on the door means I should stay away too. I understand. We both need time to think things over. I'll wait. I love you, Denton. What does it say? Does What does it say? Sidel pressed, but Angela only read the postscript aloud. P.S. You have another admirer. Chris wants to give you and Miss Pulowski one of our clues. Flora Bombach has seen it too. The word is plain. Like an airplane? Sidel asked. No, plain, like ordinary, like the wide open plains. Plains, grains. Quick, Angela, read the clues again. Good, hood, from, spacious, plain, grains, on, with, beautiful, waves, grace, thy, purple, mountain, majesties. That's it, Angela. We got it. We got it. Sidel could barely control her excitement. The will said, sing in praise of this generous land. The will said, may God guide thy gold refined. America, Angela, America. Purple mountain majesties, Angela. Whoopee. Unfortunately, Sidel Pulaski was close to the bed when she threw her crutches in the air. 
That's the end of chapter 21. We will continue with chapter 22 in the next video.